This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Nicole Doolin. On the web at NicoleDoolin.com. January 2006. Annabel Lee by Edgar Allan Poe. It was many and many a year ago, in a kingdom by the sea, that a maiden there lived, whom you may know, by the name of Annabel Lee. And this maiden she lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me. She was a child, and I was a child, in this kingdom by the sea. But we loved with a love that was more than love, I and my Annabel Lee, with a love that the winged seraphs of heaven coveted her and me. And this was the reason that long ago, in this kingdom by the sea, a wind blew out of a cloud by night, chilling my Annabel Lee, so that her high-born kinsmen came and bore her away from me to shut her up in a sepulchre in this kingdom by the sea. The angels, not half so happy in heaven, went envying her and me. Yes, that was the reason, as all men know, in this kingdom by the sea, that the wind came out of a cloud, chilling and killing my Annabel Lee. But our love it was stronger by far than the love of those who were older than we, of many far wiser than we. And neither the angels in heaven above, nor the demons down under the sea, can ever dissever my soul from the soul of the beautiful Annabel Lee. For the moon never beams without bringing me dreams of the beautiful Annabel Lee. And the stars never rise, but I see the bright eyes of the beautiful Annabel Lee. And so, all the night tide, I lie down by the side of my darling, my darling, my life and my bride, in her sepulchre there by the sea, in her tomb by the side of the sea. End of Annabel Lee by Edgar Allan Poe Recorded by Nicole Doolin On the web at NicoleDoolin.com this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marla Diane. ForbiddenDragon.blogspot.com. Edward Edward. Traditional. Why does your brand so drip with blood, Edward Edward? Why does your blend so drip with blood? And why say sad going ye o? Oh, I have killed my hawk so good, mither mither. Oh, I have killed my hawk so good, and I had no mare but ye o. Your hawk's blood was never so red, Edward Edward. Your hawk's blood was never so red, my dear son. I tell thee o. Oh, I have killed my red roan steed, mither mither. Oh, I have killed my red roan steed. Their erst was so fair and free, o. Your steed was old, and ye hae got mare, Edward, Edward. Your steed was old, and ye hae got mare. Some other drooled ye the rio. O, I have killed my father dear, mither, mither. O, I have killed my father dear, alas, and why is me, o. And what in penance will ye dree for that, Edward, Edward? What in penance will ye dree for that, my dear son, now tell me, o. I'll set my feet in yonder boat, mither, mither. I'll set my feet in yonder boat, and I'll fare over the sea, oh. And what will ye do with your tars and your haw, Edward, Edward? And what will ye do with your hours and your haw, that were so fair as sea, oh? I'll let them stand till they down far, mither, mither. I'll let them stand till they down far, for they're never mare mon I be, oh. And what will ye leave to your bairns and your wife, Edward, Edward? And what will ye leave to your bairns and your wife, when ye gang o'er the sea, o? 
The wild's a room let them beg through life, mither, mither. The wild's a room let them beg through life. For them never matter will I see you. And what will ye leave to your own mother, dear? Edward, Edward, and what will ye leave to your own mother, dear? My dear son, now tell me, o. Oh. The curse of hell from me shall ye bear, mither, mither. The curse of hell from me shall ye bear. Sick counsels ye gave to me, o. Oh. End. Recorded by Marla Diane. January 28, 2006. This good west, Prince Edward Island. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Nicole Doolin. On the web at NicoleDoolin.com. January 2006. I felt a funeral in my brain. By Emily Dickinson. I felt a funeral in my brain, and mourners, to and fro, kept treading, treading, till it seemed that sense was breaking through, and when they all were seated, a service like a drum kept beating, beating, till I thought my mind was going numb. And then I heard them lift a box, and creak across my soul with those same boots of lead again then space began to toll as all the heavens were a bell and being but an ear and i and silence some strange race wrecked solitary here end of i felt a funeral in my brain by emily dickinson Recorded by Nicole Doolin. On the web at NicoleDoolin.com His Supposed Mistress by Ben Johnson Reading by Annie Coleman for LibriVox.org If I freely can discover what would please me in my lover, I would have her fair and witty, savoring more of court than city, a little proud, but full of pity, light and humorous in her toying, oft building hopes and soon destroying, long, but sweet in the enjoying, neither too easy nor too hard, all extremes I would have barred. She should be allowed her passions, so they were but used as fashions, sometimes froward and then frowning, sometimes sickish and then swowning, every fit with change still crowning, purely jealous I would have her, then only constant when I crave her, tis a virtue should not save her. Thus nor her delicates would cloy me, neither her peevishness annoy me. End of poem. The Lake Isle of Innisfree by William Butler Yeats. Reading by Annie Coleman for LibriVox.org. I will arise and go now, and go to Innisfree, and a small cabin build there, of clay and wattles made. Nine bean rows will I have there, a hive for the honey bee, and live alone in the bee loud glade. And I shall have some peace there, for peace comes dropping slow, dropping from the vales of the morning to where the cricket sings. There midnight's all a glimmer, and noon a purple glow, and evening full of the linnet's wings. I will arise and go now, for always night and day, I hear lake water lapping with low sounds by the shore, while I stand on the roadway, or on the pavement's gray, I hear it in the deep heart's core. End of poem. 
Late Leaves by Walter Savage Landor Read by Peter Yearsley For LibriVox.org The leaves are falling, so am I. The few late flowers have moisture in the eye, so have I too. Scarcely on any bough is heard joyous or even unjoyous bird the whole wood through. Winter may come. He brings but nigher his circle, yearly narrowing, to the fire where old friends meet. Let him. Now heaven is overcast, and spring and summer both are past, and all things sweet. End of Late Leaves Move Eastward Happy Earth and Leave by Alfred Tennyson, read by Heather Barnett, for LibriVox.org. Move Eastward Happy Earth and Leave Yon Orange Sunset Waning Slow, From Fringes of the Faded Eve, O Happy Planet, Eastward Go, Till Over Thy Dark Shoulder Glow Thy Silver Sister World, And Rise to Glass Herself in Dewy Eyes That Watch Me From the Glen Below. Ah, bear me with thee, smoothly born, Dip forward under starry light, and move me to my marriage morn, and round again to happy night. End of poem. One day I wrote her name upon the strand by Edmund Spencer. Reading by Annie Coleman for LibriVox.org. One day I wrote her name upon the strand. But came the waves and washed it away. Again I wrote it with a second hand, But came the tide and made my pains his prey. Vain man, said she, that dost in vain assay A mortal thing so to immortalize, For I myself shall like to this decay, And eke my name be wiped out likewise. Not so, quote I, let baser things devise to die in dust, but you shall live by fame. My verse, your virtues rare, shall eternize, and in the heavens write your glorious name, where, when as death shall all the world subdue, our love shall live, and later life renew. End of poem. This is from Barrowby.com. Nicholson and Lee, editors, The Oxford Book of English Mystical Verse, 1917. Poem 316, The Rose and the Cross by Alistair Crowley. My name is Yusuf Alawi, and I'll be reading this poem today. Out of the seething cauldron of my woes, where sweets and salt and bitterness I flung, Where charmed music gathered from my tongue, And where I chained strange archipelagos Of fallen stars, where fiery passion flows, A curious bitumen, where among The glowing medley moved the tune unsung Of perfect love, thence grew the mystic rose. Its myriad petals of divided light, Its leaves of most radiant emerald, Its heart of fire like rubies. At the sight I lifted up my heart to God and called, How shall I pluck this dream of my desire? And lo, there shaped itself the cross of fire. Sentence by Witter Biner Read by Carolyn Bottomley for LibriVox.org Shall I say that what heaven gave earth has taken, Or that sleepers in the grave reawaken? One sole sentence can I know, can I say, You, my comrade, had to go, I to stay. End of poem This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Nicole Doolin. On the web at NicoleDoolin.com. January 2006. Success by Emily Dickinson. Success is counted sweetest by those who near succeed. To comprehend a nectar requires sorest need. Not one of all the purple host who took the flag to-day can tell the definition so clear of victory. As he, defeated, dying, on whose forbidden ear the distant strains of triumph break, agonized and clear. End of Success by Emily Dickinson Recorded by Nicole Doolin On the web at NicoleDoolin.com This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recorded by Nicole Doolin on the web at NicoleDoolin.com January 2006 Surgeons Must Be Very Careful by Emily Dickinson Surgeons must be very careful when they take the knife. Underneath their fine incisions stirs the culprit, life. End of Surgeons Must Be Very Careful by Emily Dickinson Recorded by Nicole Doolin on the web at NicoleDoolin.com Introduction to the Reading This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording made by Robert Garrison For more information on this reader, Visit climber53.com. The Bells, published in 1849 by Edgar Allan Poe. Hear the sledges with the bells, silver bells! What a world of merriment their melody foretells! How they tinkle, tinkle, tinkle in their icy air of night, while the stars that oversprinkle all the heavens seem to twinkle with a crystalline delight, keeping time, 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 in a sort of runic rhyme, to the tintinnabulation that so musically wells, from the bells, 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 from the jingling and the tinkling of the bells. Hear the mellow wedding bells, golden bells, what a world of happiness their harmony foretells. Through the balmy air of night, how they ring out their delight, From the molten golden notes, and all in tune, What a liquid ditty floats, To the turtle dove that listens while she gloats, On the moon! Oh, from out the sounding cells, What a gush of euphony voluminously wells, How it swells, how it dwells, On the future how it tells, Of the rapture that impels, To the swinging and the ringing, of the bells, 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 of the bells, 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 to the rhyming and the chiming of the bells. Hear the loud alarum bells, brazen bells, what a tale of terror now their turbulency tells. In the startled ear of night, how they scream out their affright, too much horrified to speak, they can only shriek, shriek, out of tune in a clamorous appealing to the mercy of the fire, in a mad expostulation with the deaf and frantic fire, leaping higher, 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 with a desperate desire, and a resolute endeavor, now, now, to sit or never, by the side of the pale-faced moon. Oh, the bells, 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 what a tale their terror tells, of despair! How they clang and clash and roar, what a horror they outpour, on the bosom of the palpitating air. 
Yet the ear it fully knows, by the twanging and the clanging, how the danger ebbs and flows. Yet the ear distinctly tells, in the jangling and the wrangling, how the danger sinks and swells, by the sinking or the swelling in the anger of the bells, of the bells, of the bells, 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 bells in the clamor and the clangor of the bells. Hear the tolling of the bells, iron bells, what a world of solemn thought their monody compels. In the silence of the night, how we shiver with affright at the melancholy menace of their tone. For every sound that floats from the rust within their throats is a groan. And the people, ah, the people, they that dwell up in the steeple, all alone, and who toiling, 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 in that muffled monotone, feel a glory in so rolling, on the human heart a stone. They are neither man nor woman, they are neither brute nor human, they are ghouls. And their king it is who tolls, and he rolls, 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 rolls a paean from the bells, and his merry bosom swells with the paean of the bells. And he dances and he yells, keeping time, 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 in a sort of runic rhyme to the paean of the bells, of the bells, keeping time, 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 in a sort of runic rhyme to the throbbing of the bells, of the bells, 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 to the sobbing of the bells, keeping time, 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 as he knells, 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 in a happy runic rhyme, to the rolling of the bells, of the bells, 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 to the tolling of the bells, of the bells, 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 to the moaning and the groaning of the bells. End of poem. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Nicole Doolin. On the web at NicoleDoolin.com. January 2006. The Chariot by Emily Dickinson. Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. The carriage held but just ourselves, and immortality. We slowly drove, he knew no haste, and I had put away my labor and my leisure too, for his civility. We passed the school where children played, their lessons scarcely done. We passed the fields of gazing grain, We passed the setting sun. We paused before a house that seemed A swelling of the ground. The roof was scarcely visible, The cornice but a mound. Since then to centuries, But each feel shorter than the day, I first surmised the horses' heads Were toward eternity. End of The Chariot by Emily Dickinson. Recorded by Nicole Doolin. On the web at NicoleDoolin.com. Recorded by Beth Dudek for LibriVox.org. The Little Peach by Eugene Field. A little peach in the orchard grew, a little peach of emerald hue. Warmed by the sun and wet by the dew, it grew. One day, passing that orchard through, That little peach dawned on the view Of Johnny Jones and his sister Sue, them too. Up at that peach a club they threw, Down from the stem on which it grew, Fell that peach of emerald hue, Mon Dieu! John took a bite and Sue a chew, and then the trouble began to brew. Trouble the doctor couldn't subdue. Too true. 
Under the turf where the daisies grew, they planted John and his sister Sue, and their little souls to the angels flew. Boo hoo! What of that peach of the emerald hue, warmed by the sun and wet by the dew? Ah, well, its mission on earth is through. Adieu. End of poem. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Chip in Tampa, Florida, on January seventh, two thousand six. The Raven. By Edgar Allan Poe Once upon a midnight dreary, While I pondered weak and weary Over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, While I nodded, nearly napping, Suddenly there came a tapping, As of someone gently rapping, Rapping at my chamber door, Tis some visitor, I muttered, Tapping at my chamber door, Only this, and nothing more, Ah! distinctly I remember. It was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly I had sought to borrow from my books surcease of sorrow. Sorrow for the lost Lenore, for that rare and radiant maiden whom the angels named Lenore, nameless here forevermore. And the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before, so that now, to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, "'Tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. This it is, and nothing more. Presently my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. Sir, said I, or, madam, truly your forgiveness I implore, but the fact is I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, that scarce was sure I heard you here. I opened wide the door. Darkness there. And nothing more. Deep into the darkness, peering long, I stood there, wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming. Dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before, but the silence was unbroken, and the stillness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore, this I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, Lenore. Merely this, and nothing more. Back into my chamber, turning all my soul within me, burning soon again, I heard a tapping, something louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is something at my window lattice. Let me see what thereat is, and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment, and this mystery explore. Tis the wind, and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter, when, with many a flirt and flutter in there, stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not a minute stopped or stayed he, but with mane of lord or lady, perched upon my chamber door, perched upon a bust of palace, just above my chamber door, perched, and sat, and nothing more. Then this ebony bird, beguiling my sad fancy into smiling by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore, Though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I'd said, art sure no craven, ghastly, grim, and ancient raven, wandering from the nightly shore. Tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's Plutonian shore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Much I marvelled. This ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore, for we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door, bird or beast upon the sculpted bust above his chamber door, with such name as nevermore. But the raven, sitting lonely on that placid bust, spoke only that one word. As if his soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing further than he uttered, not a feather than he fluttered, Till I scarcely more than muttered, 
Other friends have flown before. On the morrow he will leave me, as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, Nevermore. Startled at the stillness broken by reply so aptly spoken, Doubtless, said I, what it utters is its only stock and store, Cut from some unhappy master, Whom unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster, Till his songs one burden bore, To the dirges of his hope that melancholy burden bore of never, never more. But the raven, still beguiling all my sad soul into smiling straight, I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door. Then upon the velvet sinking I betook myself to linking fancy unto fancy, thinking that this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, Gaunt and ominous bird of yore meant in croaking nevermore. Thus I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing to the fowl, whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining with my head at ease, reclining on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamplight gloated o'er but whose velvet violet lining with the lamplight gloating o'er she shall press ah nevermore then methought the air grew denser perfumed from an unseen censer swung by seraphim whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor wretch i cried Thy God hath lent thee by these angels he has sent thee respite, respite in Nepenthe from thy memories of Lenore. Quaff, O oh, quaff this kind Nepenthe, and forget the lost Lenore. Quoth the raven, Nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, whether tempter sent or whether tempest tossed thee here ashore, desolate, yet all undaunted on this desert land, enchanted on this home by horror haunted, tell me, truly I implore, is there, is there balm in Gilead, tell me, tell me, I implore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, by that heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore, tell this soul with sorrow laden, if within that distant Aden it shall clasp a sainted maiden, whom the angels name Lenore, clasp a rare and radiant maiden, whom the angels name Lenore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Be that word our sign of parting, bird or fiend, I shrieked up starting. Get thee back into the tempest and the night's plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul has spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken. Quit the bust from off my door. Take thy beak from out my heart, and take thy form from off my door. Quoth the raven, nevermore. And the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting on the pallid bust of Pallas just above my chamber door, and his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming, and the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor, and my soul. From out that shadow that lies floating on the floor Shall be lifted nevermore. The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost Recorded for LibriVox.org by Seth Woodworth Two roads diverged in a yellow wood And sorry I could not travel both And be one traveler, long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth, then took the other, as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear, though it was for that the passing there had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay, and leaves no step had trodden black, 
Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, some more ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. To Thomas Butts by William Blake, read by Yusuf Alawi for LibriVox.org. To my friend Butts I write my first vision of light on the yellow sand sitting. The sun was emitting his glorious beams from heaven's high streams. Over sea, over land, my eyes did expand into regions of air, away from all care, into regions of fire, remote from desire. The light of the morning, heaven's mountains adorning in particles bright, the jewels of light, distinct, shone, and clear. Amazed and in fear, each particle gazed, astonished, amazed, for each was a man, human formed. Swift I ran, for they beckoned to me, remote by the sea, saying, Each grain of sand, each every stone on the land, each rock and each hill, each fountain and rill, each herb and each tree, mountain, hill, Earth and sea, cloud, meteor, and star are men seen afar. I stood in the streams of heaven's bright beams and saw felfam sweet beneath my bright feet in soft female charms, and in her fair arms my shadow I knew, and my wife's shadow too, and my sister and friend, we like infants descend in our shadows on earth like a weak mortal birth my eyes more and more like a sea without shore continue expanding the heavens commanding till jewels of light heavenly men beaming bright appeared as one man who complacent began my limbs to unfold in his beams of bright gold, like dross purged away, all my mire and my clay, soft consumed in delight, his bosom sun bright, I remained. He soft, he smiled, and I heard his voice mild, saying, This is my fold. O thou ram horned with gold, who wakest from sleep on the sides of the deep, on the mountains around, the roarings resound of the lion and wolf, the loud sea and deep gulf. These are guards of my fold, O thou ram horned with gold. And the voice faded mild, I remained as a child, all I had ever known. Before me, bright shone, I saw you and your wife by the fountains of life. Such the vision to me appeared on the sea. When You Are Old by William Butler Yeats Reading by Annie Coleman for LibriVox.org When you are old and gray and full of sleep and nodding by the fire, take down this book and slowly read and dream of the soft look your eyes had once and of their shadows deep how many loved your moments of glad grace and loved your beauty with love false or true but one man loved the pilgrim soul in you and loved the sorrows of your changing face and bending down beside the glowing bars, murmur a little sadly how love fled, and paced upon the mountains overhead, and hid his face amid a crowd of stars. End of poem. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, 
or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Nicole Doolin. On the web at NicoleDoolin.com. January 2006. Wild Nights by Emily Dickinson. Wild Nights. Wild Nights. Were I with thee, wild nights should be our luxury. Futile the winds to a heart and port, done with the compass, done with the chart. Rowing in Eden, ah, the sea, might I but moor to-night in thee. End of Wild Nights by Emily Dickinson Recorded by Nicole Doolin. On the web at NicoleDoolin.com.